All right, in terms of the ligaments of the wrist, there are two types. You have your extrinsics. And your extrinsic ligaments are going to take the carpals, and they're going to attach those to the radius or the ulna. And let's look at where those would be. So, you know, anything, anything, there we go, anything connecting these two together are going to be your extrinsics. Then you have your intrinsics. And so these are interconnect within the carpals themselves. So they're not going to attach to the radius or the ulna. They're basically, let me get my red here, so they're going to connect all these carpals together and any, any connection there. So extrinsics and intrinsics in terms of the types of ligaments. So for the volar carpal ligaments, and volar is the term that we use to describe the same thing in the wrist or hand as palmar, verse the opposite of that would be dorsal. But for the volar extrinsic ligaments, there's a few to highlight, the radiocarpal ligament, which could be broken up into three. And these are named simply after the bones uh, that they connect. So you can see the radio scapho captate. It's going to connect the radius uh, to the scaphoid and the capitate. Uh, radio lunate. You can see attached to the distal radius here, going this direction. <clears throat> and then the radio scapho lunate. Because these are on the volar portion, you can imagine that these will get compressed with flexion. So flexion would shorten them, and then they would get lengthened with extension. So extension would generally lengthen them. Now, let me zoom out here. And then you also have your ulnocarpal ligament, extrinsics. The TFCC is going to be attached in here, and the ulnolunate ligament, as well as the collateral. So let me go over here. So you can see here. Oops. You can see right here. Collateral, and we'll talk about what that restricts next. Connecting there as well, both portions. Now on the dorsal side, other ligaments that are there, and because these are on the dorsal side, you can imagine that they would become stretched with wrist flexion. So wrist flexion would be the primarily lengthening um, motion for them. However, if there was a wrist distraction, they would be lengthened to some extent, either volar or dorsal ligaments for that. But in terms of these ligaments, the dorsal radiocarpal ligament, uh, you can see it's a major ligament. Look at the size uh, and the orientation of that ligament. It's also right where uh, the TFCC would be as well, so there's some integration with that. Uh, and then you have your dorsal intercarpal ligament, uh, not nearly as, as big, but still a, a critical ligament here. So you can see less ligaments on uh, the dorsal aspect to focus on here. So just like at the elbow, where you have two collateral ligaments at the wrist, you have two collateral ligaments as well. We'll talk about the larger of the two, the UCL of the wrist, the ulnar collateral ligament. And you can see a picture there. And let me zoom in just so you can see the, the size of that. Uh, obviously connecting the ulna to the carpal bones. And uh, in, in doing that, it's going to limit any motion going in this direction. So it is going to limit radial deviation, RD of the wrist. It's going to get compressed or shortened with 
ulnar deviation. And then we'll talk next about the radiocollateral, which is going to be the opposite. So for the RCL, or the radiocollateral ligament, obviously connecting the radius to uh, the carpal bones, and it's going to limit any motion in this direction. So that is going to be ulnar deviation. Or you could also say it's going to get shortened in radial deviation. Okay, so we're going to go over radial carpal joint play next, but that would be a good time to do the cheesy dad joke portion of the online talk. Uh, so this one's about a snail. A snail was slithering along the street one day when he was attacked by two turtles. Uh, so then afterwards, the police uh, start to question him about what happened, and the policeman said, did you get a good look at the turtles who did this to you? And Miss Snail replied back, no, it all, it all happened so fast. Boom. Okay, yeah, so that's, that's the joke. Okay, so let's talk about radiocarpal joint play. Uh, you can see here on the left, uh, the wrist is in an extended position. And so you have to think about the shape of the joint surfaces. So the radius here we know is this concave, or actually biconcave surface. Uh, and then the lunate, the one that's moving, is convex. So you have a convex moving on a concave, which means it'll be opposite. So you get the slide in this direction, and you get the roll in that direction. Uh, so if you're thinking about anatomical position, extension occurs in a posterior direction, and so this would make this an anterior direction. So it's a posterior roll, anterior glide, or anterior slide. And then with flexion, same pattern, you still have a convex surface moving on a concave. So the slide or glide is one direction, and the roll is in the opposite direction. So just think at the radiocarpal joint, think that it's the opposite rule that's applied. So uh, the movement of the hand is going to be opposite of the glide. Oh, and then the other question, um, what happens in the closed pack position of extension uh, plus radial deviation? Well, anytime you have a joint, I shouldn't say anytime, most of the time when you have a joint in a closed pack position, the surfaces are closer together, so you're going to get a decreased amount of movement. And we'll test this in lab, and you can notice that whenever you glide the wrist in a closed-packed versus an open-packed position, there's less movement in the closed-packed position, as it is true for, for most joints. So next we have radial and ulnar deviation of the wrist, and this would occur in the frontal plane. We just mentioned how wrist extension is uh, closed-packed uh, compared to wrist flexion, which is more open-packed. So you're going to get more movement in the open-packed position uh, with this motion. And you could even pause the video now and just try this with your own hand. Put your wrist into extension and then feel how much ulnar and radial deviation you have. You notice you have a little more ulnar typically than, than radial. And then put it in a neutral position and see how much ulnar deviation, radial deviation you have. So that's something to try, and we'll do that in lab. All right, so next we have the joint play for radial and ulnar deviation of the wrist, and this is going to be identical to flexion and extension because we're dealing with the same bones. Uh, so zooming in on here. Okay, so I mean you have the radius, and you have the ulna, and with ulnar deviation, the hand is going to be going towards the ulna, uh, so it's going to be rolling medial, we would say. And the gliding or the sliding is going to occur laterally, so it's going to be in the opposite direction. And then as we look at radial deviation, uh, the same is true. Uh, the hand, the thumb, is going to be going in the radial or lateral direction, and the slide is going to be going towards the pinky finger or in the medial direction. So those are opposite, uh, same as flexion and extension in the sagittal plane, radial and ulnar deviation in the frontal plane operate on these mechanics as well. 
Next up, we talk about wrist instability. Uh, and this is certainly uh, common for a lot of individuals that do a lot of repetitive loading on their wrists and hands, especially at, at higher forces. And there's two categories that we're going to go over. They're relatively similar, but you have your dorsal intercalated segmental instability, your disease, and your volar intercalated segmental instability. So those are different categories. And as you look at these pictures, you can see that you have the bones in between the metacarpals and the radius is uh, just getting caught in different directions. Uh, so in this, in this case, you can see how the lunate is going towards the palmar surface or volar surface. And in this picture, um, it's just the opposite. You have the lunate going towards the dorsal or more posterior surface. Either way, we're talking about the stability of these carpal bones, which is being compromised. And so the, the textbook, at least for Newman's textbook, has a really good comparison of this. Uh, it's kind of like if you had trains in a track, and then even though the one ends, each end of the, of the, of the train would be uh, on the track, potentially, but if there's a, a congestion or, or compression force, then it's going to cause the middle ones to get off. And that's sort of what's depicted here. If there's instability because of sprains, of the ligamentous structures, or if the TFC is compromised, and if there's some kind of issue there, it's going to create an abnormal shifting of these of these bones. I think it's kind of this is my thing, but I think it's kind of like that snake thing. You move the one snake, and then all the other parts of the chain start to move as well. So that's an example of wrist instability. And then here's uh, how this may look on an image and then so you can see how you have the lunate and then it's going dorsally and so when the lunate is displaced dorsally that would be your dizzy. And then the last thing I'll leave you with, this is a case study, it's in the book, but I have it on the screen here, so uh, give this a read through uh, prior to class just so you're familiar with uh, the dizzy and how that might turn into a slack. And that's it, we'll leave it at that and then we'll, we'll pick things up in class. Thank you.